Welcome to our November author conversation for the 2019-2020 LEARN campaign. LEARN is our catchy acronym for Literacy, Equity, and Remarkable Notes, a project which convenes and sustains equity conversations in the margins of texts online using the digital annotation tool Hypothesis. I'm Joe Dillon from the Denver Writing Project, and I'm a co-founder of the Marginal Syllabus along with Ramey Collier. I'll be the host for this conversation. So we've got a great panel here today to discuss this month's reading, which is titled, Whiteness is a White Problem, Whiteness in English Education. It was written by Samuel J. Tanner, who's been gracious enough to join us here today. And Sam, so we're glad to have Sam, and I'll allow everyone to introduce themselves. So if everyone would please. Yeah, so my name is Sam Tanner. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Penn State system. Um, I'm a former high school English and drama teacher that I'm sure I'll talk about during this conversation today. I, I taught in the Twin Cities for about 15 years at two different high schools before finishing my PhD at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and now I am five years deep into a career in higher education, and I've spent the last gosh, I guess about 10 years now, really writing seriously about race, about whiteness, uh, about critical whiteness pedagogy. Uh, and I'm super excited to talk about the, the piece that we're here to talk about. Oh, Andrea, you're muted. I probably did it. Sorry. Hi, I'm Andrea. <laughs> I am a literacy consultant here at Oakland Schools in Oakland County, Michigan. Uh, I am an English and biology teacher and a member of Red Cedar Writing Project. Um, I think that's about it. We serve about 208,000 students in 28 school districts, about 5,000 teachers. So that's my job. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina Cantrell and I have the great honor to work for the National Writing Project. My job is to be the um, Associate Director of National Programs and um, I'm here in Philadelphia and my cat Marcy is sitting on my paper annotation. So uh, we'll see how this goes, but I'm really thrilled to be part of this discussion. So thank you. And greetings, everyone. My name is Ramey Kalir. Um, day to day, I'm an assistant professor of learning design and technology at the University of Colorado in Denver. And now, as we begin the fourth year of the marginal syllabus, it's been an honor to be one of the co-founders and co-facilitators of this project. It's really lovely to have everyone here with us in this webinar. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'd like to kick off the conversation by inviting Sam to really give us background on this, this article. And so really anything you want to share, Sam, you can talk about the writing process or just kind of the background in terms of the scholarship behind it is terrific. Yeah, so I'll, I'll dive into it. Again, I can get long-winded when I start telling a story, so stop me if need be. Um, I think it makes most sense maybe to tell a little bit of the story that led me to the, the work described in the piece. Um, and then I can kind of situate the piece that way. So like I said, when I introduced myself, um, high school English and drama teacher for about 15 years before going back to finish my PhD. Uh, my first job that I got was on the north side of Minneapolis. And for those who don't know much about the Twin Cities, uh, the Twin Cities are an incredibly racially segregated area of the country. Um, I grew up 15 minutes uh, from the school that I first got my first job at, and that was this white suburban school district. Um, and my first job at, I call it Cardinal High School, I think I refer to it in the piece, uh, was a predominantly black school, predominantly poor. Um, 10 years of white flight had drastically changed the population of that school. So I was 23, I was a white kid, and I got a job in a school where I all of a sudden was a racial minority. Um, and that really messed me up at the time. Uh, I would have, of course, said if anybody asked me about race, I would have said, "Oh yeah, I'm like I'm anti-racist, and I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of." We didn't use the word woke back then, but that's kind of what would have come out of me. Um, but very quickly, I learned that my whiteness was a significant problem in my ability to connect with most of my students of color. Uh, and so, without really intending to, I spent the first four years of my career really having to think deeply about what it meant that I was a white person. 
um, and how that put me into relationship with my students. So I got really used to talking very frankly about like whiteness and race. Um, and about four years in, I got recruited to lead the theater program at a school across town that was a little more affluent and a little more white. Uh, and I took the job and I may as well have been entering a brand new career in this white school. Um, and, and all sorts of things happened, some of which I outline in the piece, others of which I've written about extensively now, where like I really struggled to fit into this much wider school and, and sort of to be accepted there, mostly with my colleagues and, and my administration. Um, but one of my great frustrations was just how difficult it was to get white students to talk about race in the ways I'd become accustomed to doing so in my previous job. Um, and, and I found that to be so deeply frustrating. Uh, and, and I found it was so hard to get white folks to see that like, like they actually, like, like race was about them just as much as it was about people of color. So that frustration sort of led into my dissertation uh, project. I was working with Tim Lensmeyer, one of my advisors at the University of Minnesota, uh, who's written a beautiful book recently called White Folks uh, that's all about white identity. Um, and, and Tim was doing work in, in what's called second wave critical whiteness studies. I talk about that in the piece as well. Um, and we can maybe get into that later. Um, but so essentially I designed a piece, uh, some pedagogy to invite the mostly white students in our theater program to investigate whiteness. Uh, and we spent a year voluntarily in the fall, about 40 students um, did YPAR, Youth Participatory Action Research with me to understand whiteness. They came up with projects and we met before and after school and on the weekends um, to discuss their work. And then in the winter, we used the, what, what emerged from their re research to create a, a, a collaborative play. They ended up writing an 82-page script called Blanche Crest, a collaborative play about whiteness. Um, Blanche Crest is an amalgam of French and German and means white circle. Uh, it was 40 kids writing a play together, which was madness, uh, but they ended up creating what I came to argue was really a beautiful expression of this community that was suffering from a virus. Um, the virus made folks go blind the people who went blind thought that that meant they had privilege to rule the town um and and sort of eventually we just sort of realized that the virus was their metaphor for white supremacy um and so they created this script and then in the spring i directed this as our high school play um about a week before it went up we got some media attention uh and and a local radio host actually wanted to get the community to come out and boo uh, at the play or march at the play. Uh, my principal wanted to get armed guards for the play. She got so worried about it. Um, if you're familiar with Glenn Beck, who's a conservative pundit, he caught wind of it. He posted a story on a, on a blog about how I was a scruffy little man who was trying to destroy America. Um, I thought that was particularly funny because he had never seen me, but I am pretty scruffy and little. So like he got that part right. Um, so we did this project and uh, had a huge audience turn out. It ended up being a really, I thought, productive, peaceful project. project. Um, and, and that ended up becoming my dissertation research. And I realized as I was finished that all I had done was unearth uh, enough material for me to spend the next 20 years of my life thinking about in this work of what it means to engage white folks in serious considerations of their own whiteness, but then anti-racism in a white supremacist context. How do you actually engage white folks in that? Um, and so uh, I, my recent book is called Whiteness, Pedagogy, and Youth in America. I'm pretty sure is the title that it ended up with. Um, and that sort of just tells the story of this project that I've, I've told you here. And like I said up front, I've spent five years now writing really serious about, seriously about whiteness. Um, and the piece we're talking about today feels like uh, one of just the major takeaways that I took from all of this work I've just described to you, which is that, uh, you know, I opened the piece with a quote from Richard Wright that just has always stuck with me, right? Um, somebody asked him in the 50s, like, what do you do with the Negro, Negro problem in the United States? And Richard Wright just responds very nonchalantly, well, there is no Negro problem, there is a white problem. Right, and, and I cite it in the piece as well, but Toni Morrison has this interview with Charlie Rose that I found very early in the work I'm describing to you right now, where 
you know, Charlie does what a lot of white people do. He turns to a black woman and asks her what he should do about race or racism. And Char and Tony has this beautiful moment where she just looks at him and says, I don't know what you should do about it. And she says something along the lines of, it's my sense that white people have a serious problem. She calls it a, a neurosis, that it has a deleterious effect on whites. Racism has a deleterious effect on the white psyche. And she says, you stop making this about me. Take me out of this. White people have a problem. And I sort of took that as permission to really like try to make sense of what is this white problem with my high school students as we went into this work. And now all these years later, um, I continue to do work that's trying to figure out this problem. And I just have to say this, right? Um, my work, whether I'm like discussing it at a webinar like this, or I'm on a panel, I was just recently at a conference, uh, or I'm like reading reviewers feedback on manuscripts, uh, this work bothers people. And it bothers people who are, who would identify as anti-racist. Uh, it often bothers folks of color who are really not used to a white person, I think, saying and writing the things that I'm saying. Um, and I don't want to dismiss the concerns that come up, and I hope some of those concerns come up here in this talk today. Uh, but I guess at the end of the day, it seems to me like I am poking at something uh, that feels important. And when I say I am, there's all sorts of folks around the country doing this work too, um, who would situate it within second wave critical whiteness. Carlin Borshine Black has a recent book out that, that I sort of put in this tradition that's really about letting go of literary whiteness in, in English education, literacy education. Uh, but folks like Tim Lensmeyer, Jim Jupp, uh, there's a woman, Jenna Shim, at the University of Wyoming. Um, folks who are really sort of building off of the work of scholars of color, such as Toni Morrison or the Reverend Tandeika, whose book, Learning to be White, is central to how I think about this, um, who have been really generous in suggesting that maybe whiteness as only a, a material privilege doesn't actually capture the complex ha things that happen to white folks as they are made white, as they learn to be white, and then what that means as they move through the world. And, and, and as they reckon with white supremacy and anti-racism and how to engage those things. All right, I warned you that I was gonna start ranting and I did, um, but that's sort of the story of what led me into this piece. And, and for me, this piece felt like a pretty clear expression of, of, of something that I learned in, in my work over the last 10 years now, I guess. So I think that was fantastic background for the piece, and I appreciate you, uh, you know, speaking at length about the work you did in schools, and now even your interest in, you know, or kind of the thinking that's gone into your, you know, your current work, and even what you hope is surfaced in this conversation. So I think it was really terrific. Um, before we jump into a, a more in-depth discussion of the text, which we've marked up, and it's usually helpful to show that we've read it and kind of marked it up, right? It before we do that, I'd like to invite Ramey to give a little bit of background about the Marginal Syllabus Project and this LEARN campaign before we dive into the text. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And of course, thank you, Sam, again, for a really lovely introduction to your, to your piece. Um, I'll briefly note that the Marginal Syllabus is a project now that uh, is sparking and sustaining conversations with educators about educational equity and a variety of topics related to educational equity of which a focus on whiteness, critical whiteness studies, critical white pedagogy, whiteness pedagogy, as uh, you're specifically talking about, Sam, all of that fits so well in the kind of broad purview of the conversations rooted in equity concerns, issues, and opportunities that has really come to define the marginal syllabus community over the last number of years. We use the, 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 the name marginal syllabus in a very intentional way. Uh, in one sense, we're engaging with marginal perspectives. And, Sam, you just spoke to that. You said, if I'm not mistaken, you know, this work bothers people and we are engaging with authors and perspectives that are very much marginal to the status quo of American schooling and a status quo that in many ways um, upholds inequity by design. Um, another sense of marginal that we use is that when the text of Sam's article or any marginal syllabus conversation moves into an online or a digital space, we use a collaborative technology called Hypothesis, a free tool to begin having conversations with one another in the margins of an online text. And so we have these marginal conversations about these so-called marginal perspectives and readings. And then of course, the last piece of this is that we are encouraging educators 
to take a very alternative approach to their professional learning, one that is interest-driven, one that is open-ended, and one that is, again, very um, divergent to dominant forms of educator professional learning in, in at least an American context. Um, I want to specifically mention, of course, that uh, this is the second year now that we've been partnered with the National Council of Teachers of English. We are so fortunate for their support. All of the articles in the first iteration of the LEARN syllabus during the 2018-19 academic year came from NCTE publications. And this year, throughout 2019 into 2020, this second iteration of the LEARN syllabus will also draw exclusively from NCTE publications again, of which Sam's article appears in the journal English Education. We are, of course, also quite thankful to the National Writing Project, who has been an advocate for and key supporter of our work for many years now, as well as, again, the nonprofit Hypothesis uh, for their support as well. And the last thing I'll just mention, because, again, the marginal syllabus is not possible without author partnerships. It is authors like Sam um, who say, yes, not only can you read and discuss my work, you can do so in a public way and in a way that can be annotated. And in that spirit of engaging with authors to have consent to engage in this kind of public discourse, um, I wanted to make note of something that Sam, you actually wrote in this article. It really stood out to me um, because you acknowledge in the end of your article, in your acknowledgement section, um, two other scholars, Dr. April Baker Bell and Dr. Lamar Johnson. Um, Dr. Baker Bell was a partner author in the marginal syllabus during the 2017-2018 marginal syllabus. Um, Dr. Baker Bell, along with some of her colleagues, um, wrote a piece um, about racial injustice and critical media literacy that we read and discussed um, in that marginal syllabus a few years ago. And then in this year's syllabus, um, Dr. Lamar Johnson will be another partner author of ours as we conclude our work. Um, his, um, one of his recent articles will actually be the last article in this syllabus. And so I just think that there's some really nice dots to connect there between the influences on your work, Sam, and the engagement of many kinds of authors from many perspectives and traditions of scholarship who are engaging now over a number of years in the marginal syllabus. So I'll leave my introduction there. I am eager to engage in this conversation today and, and so thankful to have everyone with us. Thanks for that, Ramey. And so now it's, you know, it's my pleasure to transition us to a conversation of the piece. And, and Andrea is our, our reader respondent who we've invited. Christina, Ramey, and I are more fixtures in these conversations. So Andrea, where would you like to start this conversation in terms of your notes or maybe your questions for Sam? Yeah, so I have a bunch, so <laughs> prepare yourselves. So first I wanted to note that um, in my annotations are all in hypothesis already, so they're already public. Um, so anyone, I know, because when you guys put it out there last week, I already had started, um, I had read this when it first came out, and I'm glad that you mentioned um, Carlin Borsheim Black and her co-author, whose name is escaping me right now, so I'll Google that in a minute, but they, Letting Go of Literary Whiteness, we just had our Michigan Council of Teachers of English, April Baker Bell is our president, um, and for this upcoming year. And we have a subcommittee focused on um, diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity. So, um, and Dr. Lamar Johnson's also on our executive committee for um, MCTE. And Carlin presented on her book as well. So this is like all swirling about. This all happened like last week <laughs> for me. So um, that is the context in which I'm annotating. And like one of the first questions that I had was, um, you mentioned that you felt that white privilege wasn't a useful tool uh, for dismantling white supremacy. And I just wondered if you could talk about that in a little bit more. It sort of alluded to in the piece, but I'm not sure you had enough time to go into it. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and so let's, I'll, I'll kind of think about it with you for a moment. Um, so yeah, a lot of the, the second wave of critical whiteness studies work that I kind of situate myself in, um, I don't want to call it a reaction against, but I feel like it, it's a move out of sort of the tradition of white privilege pedagogy, which, which folks in the second wave, I think would sort of term like first wave of critical whiteness studies work. Um, and essentially, I'll just be like really clear about it, right? So 
Tim Lensmeyer and a group of authors have a piece in 2013 that came out in Harvard Ed Review, um, and it's called Peggy McIntosh as Synecdoche, uh, something along those lines, and Synecdoche is a big word that just means it, uh, their argument was that white privilege has come to stand in for the only way that whiteness is talked about in the field of education, right? Um, and they found that to be really strange. A group of, it's called the Midwest Critical Whiteness Collective, and I was a part of this. So um, it was graduate students and professors and teachers and even administrators in the Midwest who started meeting, um, gosh, a, a while now ago, about 2011, I think. And that we would just meet once a month and sort of, as a group of white people committed to anti-racism, sort of work together to make sense of some things. Um, and that piece is this really pretty strong argument that, that white privilege becomes this, this almost simple, weird way to talk about whiteness without actually talking about whiteness. And by that, I mean white privilege pedagogy, which I've experienced, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of the folks listening to this would have experienced, where you're sort of presented, here are all the privileges granted to white folks, here are the privileges that you have. Um, and sort of at the end of those sessions, you're usually left with two options. Either you admit that you have privilege um, and then you're good, or you deny you have privilege and then you're a racist and then we have to figure out what to do with you. Uh, neither of those options for me give white folks much in the way of tools to either understand how their whiteness has been made or to engage anti-racism in any sort of real way, right? Um, and so I guess I'm pretty convinced that the white privilege stuff that I've been around Almost, almost essentialize whiteness as whiteness is only this list of material privileges when frankly scholars of color such as uh, Ralph Ellison or Richard Wright uh, or and Toni Morrison and Tandaica like I've talked about they don't write about whiteness as privilege they write about whiteness as neurosis they write about whiteness as damage um, David Rodiger's work Wages of Whiteness um, really takes seriously the cost of whiteness right and I, I'm very hesitant to get into this game where we like try to figure out if white people suffer as much as folks of color. Like, that's not what I'm saying, although folks often read that into what I'm saying, right? Like, let's be real. Black and brown people are dying in this country now and have for a long time because of white supremacy, and white people, for the most part, aren't, right? Um, but I also take seriously Reverend Tandaica when she says that the white self is a failed self. It's a self in a constant state of, she calls it civil war right? Um, and that the byproduct of that civil war is rage uh, and what she calls as white shame, but she writes about shame in a much different way than, than sort of the colloquial use of it, right? So, I mean, I don't want to get like too political and I don't know how to say this, but um, when I see what's happening in this country right now and I see white people in auditoriums screaming or marching, these don't look like healthy people to me. They don't look like people who are just peacefully enjoying the fruits of their privilege. There looks like damage there. And when I saw what happened to my high school students, when we really did make whiteness the center, right? Like most of my white students had gone through white privilege trainings in their social studies class. They did the privilege walk. And at the end of it, they knew that they had privilege and they were so quick to admit they have privilege, but they couldn't actually have a conversation about what white supremacy was. And so many of my colleagues who were on the equity team at some of the schools that I worked with, very quick to point out all the ways in which they had privilege, but they got so nervous the minute we started talking about white supremacy. Um, so I can go further and, and sort of talk about specific examples of that. There's a piece I have out that's called Permission to be Confused towards a second wave of critical whiteness pedagogy that really sort of takes up what a second wave of critical whiteness pedagogy offers that white privilege pedagogy doesn't. Uh, and what I think it offers is a space of complexity and nuance to see whiteness as a process of becoming, right? A and, and to imagine that we might be able to intervene on white supremacy in those spaces. Gosh, I ranted again. I, I mean, I just... <laughs> yeah, no, I think that script, I think it just would be surprising. So I'm thinking about the teachers that I support who are very well intentioned and are ready to admit that they have white privilege. And then when it comes to, well, let's talk about To Kill a Mockingbird as your whole class novel, then there's a different conversation that ensues. Um, and I think in the spirit of your storytelling, I'll also center myself in this conversation a little bit, which is uh, I, um, white, was raised in another very segregated part of the country. And when I was 
first teaching, I was teaching an alternative ed program. Now I wasn't certified yet, so I had this like weird grant funded position in the school. And where there was a lot of other grad students around, I was not a grad student at the time. I was sure I would never be a grad student. I was wrong. But uh, there were a lot of grad students around and they were doing exactly what you're talking about, which was exploring their whiteness. I didn't have a name for any of this, but it was how I was inducted into my profession. And so I didn't understand that it wasn't the experience of everyone. And also I was working with students in poverty and um, it was a pretty diverse school. Uh, after my student teaching, I was hired into a district that I was also the only white person in the room often, and I was teaching African American Lit, so I was teaching Black Boy, and I was teaching Frederick Douglass, and uh, it felt weird to me to enforce uh, wearing their, you know, ID badges <laughs> as this white person, like to enforce all this compliance. There felt like there was like a lot of what now I would name white supremacist pedagogy, uh, a compliance-focused pedagogy on my students. Um, and I was, in the meantime, talking about my own racism and um, that I'm swimming in the same racist soup as everybody. And there are things that I've internalized that I might not even realize. So I was naming that in my classes. Also, again, like, you know, I'm 22 or something. I had no idea that what I was doing was going to about to, like, <laughs> trigger everyone around me. So. That was really like how I came into the profession and, um, you know, would literally say things like, well, I'm racist and own that in a way to sort of like destigmatize it, I guess. I don't know what I thought I was doing. I have no names for any of this because I'm not a critical race scholar in any way. It's just the, where my nose went. Um, and so I think for me and where I am in my work, um, it, it's a lot of trying to then I don't know how to like unpack that for people, the moves that I was making, because I just was mentored really deeply by really smart people who are now scholars in our field, like Carlin and I were teachers at the same time we went through Red Cedar together. So we were having these conversations as young teachers. Um, and I didn't, I don't know how to unpack that for people, I guess. So I, I, what I really like about this work is like it's one way to model a conversation about race that I think is hard. But also, I think, you know, in talking to my colleagues working with young teachers or teachers in the field, this like wall you hit the second you try to talk about whiteness. Um, and it also happens, I think, in other um, identities that are marginalized too when you're trying to go after equity. Um, you know, we have the same problem with LGBT. I think it comes up in the text a lot, LGBTQ. Um, texts also get challenged all the time. And so, like, whenever you're dealing with these, issues that fight the power, <laughs> like you just get the wall. So I, I think any more that unpacking we can do in this conversation about how to help people on that journey. So like, okay, I've accepted that I have privilege. Now, how do I, like, what's next for me? What's, how do I unpack that? Is it through our storytelling? Is it getting like, like Robin, De, I think it's Robin DeAngelo talks about the white affinity group to talk through these things. And so, um, I don't know, I would like to hear you talk about that next. Yeah, I've got like a million thoughts in my head, but I swear I'm going to be concise. Uh, I want to tell you a quick story, and then I want to talk a little bit about that last part of your question, the storytelling. So um, in this piece I mentioned, the permission to be confused piece, it's just there's this thing that my students said that blew me away when I was doing the whiteness project, is, is what we called the work I described in the high school. So in the in the fall early on the students met with me on a Sunday they we did two workshops and the first workshop and I was doing this in a theater program so they were sort of theater based workshop arts based stuff um, but the first workshop was pretty much your straight white privilege workshop because I basically thought you can't do this without like doing some white privilege stuff right so we did this sort of white privilege workshop we did a little social justice theater with it too and I had a friend of mine who taught across um, the cities who really was steeped in white privilege who came in and did it right so the kids did the white privilege workshop and this girl, this 11th grader who I call Cecilia, she left that workshop and she wrote me an email that night and she said, Mr. Tanner, I feel really awful about everything and about myself. Like, I just feel gross. And it was this long email about like, that white privilege workshop was just like, like she left it and she felt awful and she had no idea like what to do, right? 
two weeks later, we did what we called a critical whiteness workshop where a couple of my friends, colleagues from graduate school came in and we actually did, we did more theater work, but we also went through race law in the 1600s and sort of unpacked the ways in which white folks actually could get punished in the same way that slaves could get punished if they didn't adhere to certain laws and these sorts of things. And we really did this sort of unpacking of historical white supremacy, right? Um, and, and, and that, that same student, Cecilia, right? So she was in the project the whole year. And later on that year, we were doing this presentation at the University of Minnesota, some um, like social justice conference, and they were on a panel. And Cecilia said, after the white privilege workshop, I felt awful and I didn't know what to do. After the critical whiteness workshop, I gave myself permission to be confused. And I thought, that statement was so profound to me because I think that's exactly what we don't give white people permission to be confused. White people are so desperate to say the right thing or to like look at the person, people of color in the room and make sure they're not saying something racist that they don't actually think about the things that are going on inside of them. And so I read her saying she gave herself permission as this just profoundly courageous thing to do. I'm going to be open now and I'm going to be, I'm going to sit in my confusion with this, right? Um, now, of course, that's dangerous because as a teacher, I can't control what she does with that confusion. And I can't aim her towards some specific like anti-racist outcome that I want her to reach. Although if I'm gonna be really honest to you, I have yet to meet the person who has a solution to racism in the United States. And so to think that we could have outcomes about what students are supposed to say to solve that problem seems just like a, a little not right to me. At the same time that like, in doing this work, there's the real risk that white people are gonna say and do really racist things. And in fact, if people of color are around that work, there's a real risk that people of color can be hurt by this sort of thing, right? And that's gonna lead me into the second thing I wanna say here. Um, and there's really no easy way to say this, right? So you mentioned April Baker Bell and Lamar Johnson, who are two of like the most brilliant people I've met, like they're brilliant scholars. Um, and one of the reasons I acknowledged them in this piece was I set out to write this piece with the two of them. We had been talking about this work and we sort of got to it and we, I knew I was co-editing this special issue with English education. Um, and so we started going down the road and after some pretty heavy conversations, April was like, you know what, Sam, I don't think we're supposed to be with this piece. This piece isn't about us. This, this is about like white folks and this is about you, right? And, and that was such a funny moment because I realized at that point that even as this person who spent the last 10 years thinking about my whiteness in relationship to these two scholars of color as we were working together, I continued to make the moves that white people always make when people of color are there, looking or waiting for approval. Or Bell Hooks said in the 90s, she said, if, if your white anti-racism is dependent on the approval or the forgiveness of people of color, you're not actually doing anything, right? So, so we sort of had this amicable like realization like that this project wasn't about them. Um, and, and then, and I think part of that goes to this, uh, I'll say this quickly. So I was just down in Texas at the curriculum and pedagogy conference. Um, I'm co-editor for the Journal of Curriculum and Pedagogy. It's sort of this small group that does curriculum theory and curriculum studies. Um, and I was on a panel and the question for the panel was, doesn't this work on whiteness just recenter whiteness? Which is feedback I've gotten now in all sorts of ways, right? And I think people are really nervous now about whiteness work that all you're doing is putting white people back in front of the room and making it about white people again, right? And I think that's a fair concern. I, I firmly believe that space needs to be made for people of color and voices of color and those things need to be like centered. At the same time, um, I don't think we've actually figured out what whiteness is in a way that allows white people to center whiteness in a way where they're actually thinking about it, right? Um, and part of the Midwest Critical Whiteness Collective, where that came from, was we were white people who were working in communities of colors and really serious about anti-racism, but we had some crap to figure out as white people. And sometimes when you're figuring out this stuff, it does more harm to the people of color who have to be a part of it, right? Because you, people of color were so quick to put them in this position where they're supposed to like be the ones to teach the white people about race or fix racism. And I think I say this in the article pretty directly. I, it just couldn't be more offensive to me that folks of color have suffered now for hundreds and hundreds of years at the hands of white supremacy. And now it's their job to teach white people about what Toni Morrison said is a white problem. Like you think, 
it, it's that whole like, go get your people comment, right? I just feel like white people have work to do. And no, I'm not advocating that white people like segregate themselves in an echo chamber and all of a sudden start celebrating logics of white supremacy. I don't want that. But I think there are, there are engaged, critical white folks who are serious about this work, who would benefit from some work together. And I think back to the Whiteness Project with those high school students, right? Um, there were students of color who were engaged with it and were around it. But it was pretty clear pretty early on that this wasn't about them and that, that they weren't actually getting stuff out of it. And a lot of what these white people were saying bothered them. Um, but I remember very distinctly one of the girls, and, and, and what's funny about this whiteness project is uh, 10 years later, I still get emails from these students almost all the time. We're still constantly talking about race. Um, the relationships, it's amazing how those stuck with it, right? Um, but one of the girls was like a, a black student who was sort of involved in the project was like, uh, look, I hated being around this Mr. Tanner. I hated what they said. I hated what they did. But that's what these people need to do. They need to figure this stuff out, right? It's complicated. It's, it's really complex. And that question about recentering whiteness is a very real one. Um, I have intellectual things that I could say about it. I have emotional things that I could say about it. But I don't think it's actually easy. And I, I actually don't even know that I'm all that clear on what I want to say about that, other than I think I think we need spaces where white folks can make serious sense of their whiteness if we're actually going to ask them to engage in anti-racism in a way that just isn't shutting up and nodding when people of color talk. Dudes, man, I, I'm telling you, these rants that are coming out of me. I, no, it's brilliant, Sam. Hey, listen, so I really appreciate, first of all, you taking and holding the floor because that's why we invited you here. And also, and your work is powerful. And what I also want to do, though, is, is see if we can get a little bit of a different dynamic. We talked about a student wanting to be able to, or kind of being okay with being a little bit confused. And so I wonder if, like, Ramey, Christina, Andrea, and myself can share our notes with each other so you can listen for a few. And we may end up circulating a little bit of confusion, or we might talk to each other about our notes. But that way, if you don't feel like you have to answer, then we'll come back to you in just a moment. I don't know how that feels, but we'll see how it goes. I like it. So would somebody like to start off? Well, actually, maybe I'll just share since I'm uh, since I got the floor open anyway. I I made a note because I really like this idea of uh, on page 184 where Sam writes about the problem of being white is should also be separate from issues of people of color. So it's connected, of course, but what are some of the ways it's separate? And that was kind of a new thing for me to think about. And so I was, I want to think through the ways that the problem of being white can be separate from interacting with people of color or turning to them. And I thought about one way was something that Andrea mentioned earlier was when white educators are looking over syllabi and we have to talk about something like, you know, to kill a mockingbird or something like that, that might be a place where we don't have to look to people of color for an answer. We can sort of think critically ourselves about problem, problematic whiteness. I don't know what you all think about that. Yeah, I do think that that sort of spending time with some of the texts, you know, having shared text to then talk through whiteness through um, feels like a really helpful place to start. And I actually had a question for Sam that he doesn't have to answer now, but you know, it's like, we, like thinking about even sort of, uh, you know, Mockingbird's one text, but I was also thinking about um, young adult texts and, and theater, he has a theater and a drama background. So I was also thinking, um, and I'm interested in that sort of, um, you know, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we manufacture around um, what America is, our history stories, our, you know, imaginative stories, our dramas, and looking at sort of the different ways that whiteness manifests itself in um, a set of texts. I could see that as a really um, powerful way to do some unpacking and have these sort of shared references to, to organize around. That's just one thought. Well, 
let's share something that might take this in a slightly different direction. And I don't want to presume that. <clears throat> Let me step back a, a, a little bit, which is to say that um, over the last, again, three now plus years in this marginal syllabus project, um, I think that we might glimpse at times. I'm not going to say that this always happens, but I think that there are glimpses of educators and, and specifically white educators whose reading and engagement with certain texts has given them some permission to be confused and that they might name and voice that. And I just want to mention that because I do think that uh, whether people are watching, listening to this webinar and they're learning about the marginal syllabus for the first time, or perhaps they're regular participants, that if you've joined particularly the annotation conversations, and I would again think of particular texts, not every text, and again, particular contributions and not every annotation contribution, there have been glimpses of that permission to be confused, um, which kind of leads me to a, a second kind of point, which is that you know the five of us who have joined in this webinar in this conversation now, and I think that this meta comment is, is perhaps appropriate, all self-identify, if I'm not mistaken, as, as white, as white Americans. Um, and that is coincidental to today's conversation with you, Sam. But if one, again, watches or listens to these webinars regularly, that's actually not necessarily representative <laughs> of a typical marginal syllabus webinar. And so it's, again, it's a coincidence that we five happen to have joined together today. But if one was to go back to our video gallery, you would see a variety of groups of educators from all walks of life and all kinds of backgrounds and trainings and life experiences who come together to discuss these issues. And so it's not lost on me that even this conversation in the moment um, is playing with this tension of centering white individuals talking about whiteness, while also perhaps provoking others to think of if not have their own conversations about those uh, topics. And then the last thing I'll say, because now I feel like I'm the one who's rambling, <laughs> is that given the title of this uh, text, the need to have these conversations, but also the kind of broad purview of the marginal syllabus conversation, I wonder if indeed we find marginal spaces for white people to have these conversations and if that is one way of not necessarily centering these conversations, even if it is white people having to begin to disentangle and wrestle with and think about moving from an awareness of white privilege to the types of tools and strategies that do indeed dismantle white supremacy and mitigate the neuroses of whiteness that Sammy was speaking about earlier. So I'll leave my comments there. Maybe that provokes or gets us thinking about other things. Uh, I was just looking over my annotations too, and you know, I I was really worrying a little bit about centering whiteness too much um, and making sure we're really. I think it is important to grapple with this, and like I said, my own background, I've had the privilege of being mentored by people who allowed me to have some confusion, and I'm not without confusion now. Uh, but I do worry about when I'm facilitating conversations with teachers around issues of diversity and inclusion and justice and equity that touch on race topics. There's without fail someone who needs to do this work who sort of there's like a river of white guilt that gets discharged into the room and I'm looking around at my friends of uh, various ethnicities, uh, people of color in the room. And the I feel sick about it because suddenly they've not had any space to talk. And so like as a facilitator having to cut those things off and then what do I do with that person who's grappling in that confusion, who wants to talk more um, and is in that uh, sort of white fragility, white guilt space. And I don't know what the, what the answer is to that either. Um, as a person who's thinking about the development of other teachers rather than my own teaching practice at the moment, it's just something I'm noodling on as I'm trying to be part of this work. Um, so that's where my confusion is because it's like, Ugh, I don't want all the errors to leave because you feel guilty about your privilege. Um, that doesn't feel like it's moving the conversation forward to me. And maybe it is, I'm not giving enough space to the confusion. Andrea, I just wanted to pick up on that 
too, because in um, any adjunct graduate teaching I'm doing, I'm mostly working with white educators. Um, and just because the state of education these days. And, um, and I recently had an experience where I used um, many texts from marginal syllabus tried to, and weave them through the, the, our readings each week. And I definitely ran into both, I mean, guilt, there was the people grappling with those kind of questions for sure. I also ran into very explicit white supremacy. I mean, like constantly, right? So trying to figure out like, oh, okay, how do I respond to that? Especially in this context of like in the margins of text and I, I was teaching a distance class. So it was sort of an interesting challenge that I'd love to talk to people about in general. Um, and then, and then folks who really wanted to do, you know, felt like wanted to, to take action, right? And I ran a lot into, I think, what um, something that Sam brings up in his article is that um, this sort of response, like, well, I don't have any kids of color in my classroom, so we don't talk about this stuff. And, you know, sort of like not realizing that that like not anticipating that, I, I, I also found myself sort of flailing at what to say. Um, so I was very, so I so appreciate your article, Sam, and sort of bring me back to sort of center where I, where the conversation needs to be in that, that context. But it was just really interesting running into sort of like all the things, you know, um, including guilt and just sort of like overwhelmedness. Um, but you know, a lot of people really want to do right and also feel like they can't talk about it unless they have a diversity in front of them or don't need to or something or it doesn't come up. So anyway, I, I, I found myself really challenged by that too. I, I'm, I'm so loving listening to this. Um, I was just writing about it this morning. So Toni Morrison's Playing, with the Dark, Playing in the Dark book, she talks about the Africanist image. And I actually don't remember if I wrote about this in the paper or not. Um, but she says that in, in like studying American literature, she's so aware of the Africanist image, which is the white imagination for what blackness is. And that, that so like real and imaginary people of color in the white mind mediate the way that white people can even see that there is race or something, right? So it's like, there's always this need to be looking, looking for something from folks of color that I don't think has anything to do with the real folks of color who are living their lives or something. Um, oh shoot, and I had a really cool, uh, there's a reason I said that and it was gonna be good, but I was gonna follow it up with, oh yeah, um, and I get this from the Reverend Tandaica's work, Learning to Be White. So I have the same thing. I work with a bunch of white pre-service teachers because most teachers in this country right now are white. Um, and one question I ask almost all the time, and I always find a way to do it. Right now I'm doing it when I teach Reader's Workshop to um, liter in literacy methods. Asking a white person when they learn to be white and then having them do a seven minute journal entry on it is a profoundly fascinating question because as much as I believe whiteness is centered in this country and always has been, it's not centered in a way that is visible to most white folks. And simply asking, when did you become white and what did you learn unleashes stuff. And I wanna say one last quick thing here. Um, so much of my work is rooted in theater and improv theater, right? Um, and I think race, as much as we can sit and talk about it in these intellectual spaces, it is an embodied thing, it is an emotional thing. And the one thing I love about theater is when you have people up in a circle or when you have people making scenes together and their bodies are connected, you, you don't have to talk about race in these overly rational ways that almost sometimes take us away from the deeply felt experience of it. So I know I, I, we're sort of short on time, so I just want to say that some of my recent work has been with a colleague, Aaron Miller, in the UNC system, and we've been using improv theater in elementary classrooms and high school classrooms as a way to discuss anti-racism with students. Um, and all I'll say is what's emerged from using improv in that way feels to me profoundly generative because we get past this sort of over intellectual, what should I say right now? Or what do I need to think right now? Um, 
but there's so much work to be done. It, it, Tim, Tim's final word in his book, White Folks, he, after this beautiful study of whiteness, he just says, um, white folks have work to do and it's way past time for us to start. So I really appreciate that that comment. And I think it, it resonates with me, number one, because it's kind of your last comment in the in the piece, right? That there is work to do. And so maybe this is a good time for everyone to to go around and sort of say one takeaway or sort of a final thought. But I really appreciate I, I guess some I'll do my final thought first then is is that I really appreciate um you helping us think think through ways um, we can unpack some of this stuff as part of the our project here. I think I think this conversation is going to feed this project forward. And the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, it's been fascinating for me to get involved with authors who who will accept the label that their work is is considered marginal or deals with issues of marginality. And we've we've talked about. Um, Dr. April Baker Bell a few different times in this conversation. One of the contributions she made this year was she helped us um, winnow the list of texts down to a manageable syllabus that we could use this year. So she was very helpful with us, you know, even this year. And so I think, I think it'd be terrific if we continued to reach out to you and if you could help us think, think moving forward about, you know, how a project like this can do a lot of the work that I would agree that we have in front of us. So that's my final thought. I just wanted to jump in and say Dr. Baker Bell actually recommended this article, which I think is a really um, powerful um, gift. Um, so thank you. Um, and in terms of next steps, um, I mean, I'm, my own teaching world, my head is just, you know, <laughs> um, but I, I also am wondering about how even that quest that question you offered in that writing prompt, how we bring that to NCTE, how we situate these conversations when we're face to face um, in Baltimore in November with so many of our English educator colleagues. So that's um, one thing that I'm actively thinking about and would invite anybody, you know, listening to this and participating in the annotations to help us think about together. Uh, I'll go. So also so many thoughts in my head. I wrote down like every everything that you were mentioning. So I have my own little syllabus to snowball off of this one. And um, also the letting go of literary whiteness is supposed to be delivered to my house today. They're behind. Um, so <laughs> I know that that's on my reading list next. Um, I love the question about when did you know you were white? Um, because I think so often it's like that joke about the fish. It's like, how is the water? And I don't know. We're in water, you know, like we just don't even notice it. And to me, like that's really where my journey began with my students as, a, as an educator is sort of naming, you know, like this is the water in which we all swim and it might not be as visible to any of us uh, because they were young people. They were 14 and 15 years old. And I love the way that that question makes the familiar really strange. We use like a similar question. We're doing LGBTQ stuff too. Like, when did you know you were straight? Um, and people like minds get blown because they're like, well, I've never had to think about it because it's sort of when the default is whiteness or when the default is straightness or the default is male or whatever your default is, then that becomes really invisible. So um, I know when I knew I was white because I came home and recited a racist chant I'd heard in first grade on the playgrounds and my parents were appalled and then really deconstructed what whiteness was for me. Um, and I think that was like the beginning of my racial education. I don't think they'd ever discussed race with me before, um, but because I was raised in such a racist community, um, I was picking it up at school. So they had to undo some of that. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Anyway, thank you for the conversation. Yeah, and again, I'll just echo the, the thanks and uh, maybe pick up immediately upon uh, something that Angie, you just mentioned. Um, Sam, your question about, you know, and I wrote down two versions of it. I think I, I heard correctly and we'll edit our video at some point and kind of start 
splicing little excerpts into the annotation as well. But I think you asked, you know, when did you learn to be white, but also when did you become white and what have you learned from that? Um, I, in a very practical way, think that those might be questions that appear in the annotation version of this conversation. Um, and I think that as facilitators of kind of ongoing ways in which this webinar conversation then sparks that digital record of a conversation, um, we might find ourselves including those, those, those as prompts for educators um, to deepen that aspect of our dialogue. And so, again, if you're listening to this webinar, you know, once the online version of this conversation has taken off, maybe jump into the digital version and find these questions and perhaps add your responses as well. And then I'll also, again, echo perhaps something that Joe mentioned, which is that I do think that this particular conversation helps to set a tone um, about the kinds of conversations and the kinds of intentionality, care, and concern, perhaps, that might come to define marginal syllabus conversations throughout the year. Again, not to suggest that whiteness be centered in all of the preceding marginal syllabus conversations for the rest of this academic year, but rather um, the honoring of confusion, the uh, disentangling of terminology, the real uh, assertion that although some educators may say, you know, this doesn't necessarily give me that kind of practical thing to do on Monday morning, that in fact this is the work and that this is indeed the work that does help to again shift from some kind of broad knee-jerk awareness that things like individual discrimination is abhorrent to much more concerted strategy-based ways of dismantling systems and looking carefully at forms of social and political oppression that again becomes the water that many of us swim in and then help to perpetuate. And so I hope that that's the kind of tone that is set for the forthcoming conversations that we have um, throughout this coming year. And so thank you to all of us, all of you, those who are listening, and Sam, of course, as our partner author this month for beginning to spark and then helping us to sustain that conversation. So thank you. Terrific. Thanks, Ramey. And I just echo those thanks. So thanks to our viewers who've joined this conversation, again, of whiteness is a white problem, whiteness in English education by Sam, Samuel J. Tanner. And so we'll be annotating this online through the month of November. And um, for updates about this project, you can subscribe to our blog or sign up for a monthly newsletter at educatorinnovator.org. You can follow us at, at innovates underscore ed. And then please, if you're on social media promoting your annotations or just chatting about the project, use the hashtag marginal syllabus. So thanks again, everyone.